Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to today's meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Welcome to all members and members of the public here. Um, we've got a few items on the agenda. Firstly, I want to um, just see if we can have any um, apologies or absence recorded today. If we... Uh... So we've got apologies for um, Zach McMurray and Lee Sawsby's here deputising in his place. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, unless there's any other pod absence. Thank you, Fiona, for those. Um, next, can we see if we've got any uh, declarations of interest on any items we've got on our agenda today? I'm not seeing anyone with any declarations interest right have we had any notifications for any public questions and oh no we haven't today that 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 that's great so um firstly um our first time today i really want to put a really warm welcome to um representatives from south yorkshire um, um integrated care system we've got um gavin boyle and pierce butler here today um, um who are if you'd like to briefly introduce yourselves and then um perhaps a few minutes uh to uh, have a conversation on any points the board would like to make and uh, 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 really focusing I think today on um, what the relationship can be between um, our health and wellbeing boards at place and the developing structures and relationships um, at a South Yorkshire level. So welcome to you both. Do you want to take it away? Thank you. I am Piers Butler, Chair, designate of the ICB. Thanks, Chair. I'm Gavin Boyle. I'm the Chief Executive uh, Designate of the Integrated Care Board for South Yorkshire. And I, th I thought maybe I might start and make a few comments about the, uh, the, the Integrated Care Board and what it's, what, what it's about. And the reason for the, for the word designate in both of our titles is we're in a slightly unusual position of being responsible for an organisation that doesn't actually exist yet. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the bill that's uh, going through Parliament at the moment we're expecting to, for it to achieve, achieve uh, royal assent. And then the new organization, which is a statutory organization uh, within the NHS, the Integrated Care Board, will be established on the, on the 1st of, of July. Um, I, I thought it was perhaps worth saying a little bit about what, what its purpose is. Um, so um, in, in many ways, it, it's, a, it's a facilitator for partnership, I think, within the, the South Yorkshire system. So uh, I, I, as a newcomer, well, I'm a resident of South Yorkshire, but as a, as a newcomer uh, in a professional sense, um, I've been really impressed by, um, in, in you know, places like Sheffield, the degree of co uh, cooperation that already exists between local authorities, the NHS, the voluntary sector, and, and other partners. So uh, I think we've got good foundations to, to build on, but the ICB is principally about um, facilitating partnership uh, across South Yorkshire. Uh, at the same time as establishing the new organisation, clearly the, the clinical commissioning groups that exist in our four places, including Sheffield, uh, 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 are stood down. And the, the, the functions that are currently served by the clinical commissioning groups also become uh, a responsibility of the Integrated Care Board. Um, so what, we're, what we're, we're, we're busy about at the moment is just trying to establish the new organisation and uh, safely manage the passage, particularly of the people working in uh, clinical commissioning groups into the new organization. Um, we're also uh, appointing to the, to the board of the new organization. So uh, we'll have non-executive directors, uh, some executives, but I think importantly, some partner uh, members on the board as well. Uh, and we'll begin a, an appointment process uh, to those posts, um, probably at the beginning of May. Um, so, it's, so the intention is to make the board uh, highly representative of the, the community that we serve. Uh, just a, a brief comment on, on a couple of the, the, the other structures which are critical. I've mentioned places. Um, so for us, that's Sheffield, Rotherham, Doncaster and Barnsley. Um, on, our, on our board, we'll have an executive director for each place who's, whose responsibility will be to work with partners in those places to try and help to deliver uh, um, more integrated services, particularly between health uh, and, and care, uh, but also engaging the voluntary sector and other stakeholders as well. Um, so that's the kind of, the, the kind of architecture that, that we're, we're seeking to establish. In terms of what's it for, what are we actually trying to do? Well, I think there are probably four priorities. So one is to, to improve 
um, uh, the, 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 the kind of health outcomes and the, 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 um, the, the effectiveness of our, of our services. A second, and one that's particularly important, particularly close to my heart really, is, is around uh, health inequalities. And, and, and we know, and particularly through the experience of COVID, that different parts of our community uh, have different um, opportunities and experiences in terms of health and well-being. And I know this will be uh, a, a very much a focus of this health and well-being board here in Sheffield. So part of our aim is to try and help to address some of that, some of that inequality, which um, you know, we know is unfair, avoidable, and, and systematic. Uh, the third aim is about value for money and how do we maximize the benefits of the resources we have um, for, for, you know, for, the, um, for the communities we serve. And then the, third, the, the fourth, the final kind of objective is, is something called, it, it, it relates to our, our role as an anchor institution. There are something like 72,000 people who work in health and care within uh, South Yorkshire. The, the, the significant uh, organizations, institutions that are, uh, you know, spend resource, that, 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 that purchase goods and services. And there's something about using that scale um, to help improve the wider economic health of, um, of South Yorkshire. Um, Piers, would you want to say something about the partnership and, and the strategy? Yeah, um, so in parallel with the establishing the board of the ICB, we will also be establishing an integrated care partnership, which is where health formally sits down with local authority to determine the strategy uh, for the ICB across South Yorkshire. We've been to see informally the offices of the health and wellbeing, all four health and wellbeing boards. We are putting out a paper in the next 10 days, two weeks, with some thoughts on how that integrated care partnership might well be set up. There's a number of issues there. Who should chair it? How large it is? Who's on it? We want that to be done in partnership with our local authority colleagues. But we see the ICP as critical to moving the agenda forward, particularly around health inequality. It is where health and local authority meets formally at a South Yorkshire level. So for us, it's critical that that is, that's more than a talking shop. That's something that really does develop a coherent strategy. And then the role of it is to actually hold the ICB to account for the delivery of that strategy. So it's not the to second guess every decision of the ICB, but it is there to say, you said you were going to do something on children's health and you haven't done it. And, and that needs calling out. It's a bit of a conscience for us. Actually, we're both comfortable with that, but it means it's quite an important group. So we're going to put a note out to all partners in the next couple of weeks that will give, us, give you some options of how we might set that up. We aim to get the ICP set up before the ICB is formally established, maybe first meeting in June. And um, I hope we can see that as a really important group that helps us work together. Let me add one other thing and then I'll finish, George, if that's all right, which is um, none of this should undermine the role of the health and wellbeing boards in the four places. You have a very distinct and discreet role. It needs to continue and we will not undermine that. Um, Indeed, health and wellbeing boards will really want to feed into the ICP in quite a formal way, I would imagine, but that's part of the discussion uh, we'll have. I'll finish there, and we're happy to answer any questions. That's great. Thank you both. I think just before I open for questions, I want to make clear, if, before anyone asks a question, can I, uh, just uh, for clarity, can people just say who they are and what organisation they're from? I think that will help um, the discussion at uh, no end. Um, so does anyone want, at this stage, to ask any questions or um, make any points for... Gavin or Pierce. Um, right. Uh, first of all, um, Lee, please. Hi, uh, Lee Sorsby. I'm standing in for Zach McMurray today, but I'm a GP on um, Sheffield CCG's governing body. And I work in the north of the city, which is obviously an area that does experience quite significant health inequalities. So I really welcome your emphasis on addressing health inequalities. I think that's um, obviously something that we would absolutely endorse. As having more decades than I like to recall working in the NHS, we're really aware that often some of the targets that are set and some of the systems that are in place and some of the external pressures, rather than seeking to reduce health inequalities, actually can increase them. So my question is, you know, how well can we navigate that and how well can we actually push back against the um, targets and the artificial measures 
which actually, while they look good on paper, in practice, I can tell you from the coalface, actually just serve to increase inequalities. It's a really complex area. Um, it's very nuanced. It's, um, there's all the wider determinants which cannot be removed from just looking at targets. So I was just wondering what your stance would be on that. Well, I think, first, first of all, I think it's a fantastic question. Um, I think there's, um, I think the honest truth is that those, those um, kind of the targets, the pressures, the expectations, I don't think are going to go away. And I think particularly um, because of the, uh, the financial settlement for the NHS over the next few years, there are quite, quite rightly expectations of, of delivery. So I think that won't go away. But our, our responsibility, though, is, you know, we need to do some of those things. But it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not to lose sight of health inequalities, and actually these things are not unrelated. So if you look at things like um, um, elective waiting times, I think we're really conscious that, um, you know, we talk about people waiting for routine surgery, but if it's you who's waiting, it, it, it won't feel routine. But I do wonder whether there's a, a way of looking at even that challenge, not solely in a chronological way, but actually looking at what are the, what are the wider kind of social impacts on, of, of waiting for, for the individuals on that waiting list. I mean, another example, which is very topical, is the pressure on, on ED, for example, the A&E departments, uh, and uh, high levels of attendance. And often what you find is that when you, when you look at the, the demography of people, people attending A&E, there, there is a health inequalities dimension to that, and it often reflects, um, I guess, difficulty in access in, in the communities of those, 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 um, those people who are coming to ED. So I think actually... You know, they're not mutually exclusive, uh, responding to some of those challenges, but doing so through a health inequalities lens, I think, I think is possible. And I think that's a, a critical part of, uh, of our responsibility as an ICB, and that's why it's one of those four priorities that I mentioned. Um, can Greg, please. Thanks, George. Um, uh, Greg Fowler, Director of Public Health, Sheffield. Um, so no easy answers to this one. It's picking up where Lee left off. Um, if, I wonder if you give any thought or have given thought to the sort of the balance of the, the burning platforms versus business as usual. There are plenty of burning platforms which we know we ignore or don't do enough about because the pressure is on business as usual. And then on the inequalities point, the sort of the there is inequality in how we allocate resource within the NHS and the rest of the public service, actually, to, to be blunt. Um, and the extent to which we can help you make brave and difficult decisions. We are behind you. We're all behind you on the health inequalities point. But it's the sort of, uh, at some point, we need to make a brave, bold decision. And how, how can we best help you, enable you to make that? I mean, again, I'm happy to, to start, but I think, I mean, we've had conversations, Greg, about um, particularly the role of, of public health in helping us to identify those priorities. So, I mean, as you quite, you quite rightly say, there is a balance between business as usual and things we've got to deliver, plus, you know, those, those critical um, kind of challenges that exist within the communities we serve, whether that's, you know, through, particularly through the health inequalities lens. But, I, but I, 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 I suppose what I'm conscious of, though, when you look at uh, existing strategies, whether that's the, the ICS's strategy or indeed, you know, as, as I look at the Health and Wellbeing Board strategies in our different places, you can't disagree with anything that's in, in those strategies, but it's a huge uh, volume and spectrum of things uh, to address. And I do think one of the, the challenges for the ICB will be identify, uh, to identify a smaller number of priorities which we can really make a difference uh, on, a, on a South Yorkshire uh, basis and I particularly look I think to public health colleagues to help us with that analysis and to help us with the data and the information that enables us to make some of those choices collectively through the partnership uh, and then implement it through the through the ICB in a way that we all feel that uh, you know and they might be difficult choices because you're right your point about resource and equity um, you know it might be we need to put more resource into certain parts of the community than, than others because that's where the greatest need is. They're difficult decisions and are, and are hard, to, hard to land, but actually if we, we base that on analysis, we, we develop those, those choices through a strong partnership, then, I, then I, I, you know, I actually believe that we will, we will make progress, but we do need to prioritise. Can I add something to that? Um, I'm, I'm really clear that if we want to make a difference on health inequalities, Greg, and we are genuinely committed to that, Gavin's right, we've got to start making some choices. When I have been in South Yorkshire, working in South Yorkshire six months, I see loads of plans, 
as Gavin said, not a word of which I would argue with, but I couldn't draw out from them two or three priorities that you say, and they're the ones we're going to make a difference on. And the worry I have about the health inequality agenda in health generally is that that gets very broad, very high level, very strategic, and the targets are very low level, very measurable. And when things get tough, we go to the low level and the measurable. We've got to create some of the health inequality into measurable, bite-sized targets that we can make a difference on. And I think that's a real challenge for us. But I don't want us to, in three years' time, have the best-loved strategy in the world and not made a difference. And that's, for me, the real challenge for the ICB for the next three to five years, is we will not be able to ignore the day-to-day -day targets. We've got to start delivering them. But we will have failed if we don't also make a difference on some of those big health inequality issues. We need to work with you all to say, what are those big issues and how do we make the difference? I don't think that's easy, by the way, but I think it is the challenge. Thanks both. Can I bring Judy, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judy Robinson, <coughs> Chair of Sheffield Health Watch. Um, further on this theme, I think. Um, I think it's our view and it's acknowledged that when people are involved in both choices or difficult choices, they tend to be made better and people are able to use services in more appropriate ways. So I'm rather concerned, therefore, that I think you've got a people and community strategy, but it's a very tight timetable to be involved in that. And it seems to me the way that is shaped whether that's done together with a range of people or it comes from on high, so to speak, will partly determine how well citizens of South Yorkshire are involved and therefore how we tackle some of those health inequalities. So I'm really looking for, time, time is short, I'm looking for some reassurance that I think is about three months that this won't be the last bite at that particular cherry that we can come back to it, so it may be an interim strategy or whatever you want to call it, in order that we can do it really well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, we're in a sort of transitional phase from the, the integrated care system that was moving into putting those arrangements on a, on a more, you know, kind of um, formal basis with the creation of the statutory ICB. So it is a bit transitional. I think what I would say is absolutely that's an emergent strategy. That, you know, that, that's not going to be the finished article. And I think what Piers was talking about, about the integrated care partnership, um, you know, one of its roles will be to develop that, that future strategy in a way that, that genuinely engages the, the people of South Yorkshire in, in, the, in the choices that, that we make. With a specific reference to Healthwatch, I mean, we, we, would, we would hope Healthwatch would be, you know, part of that, that process. Uh, and actually, um, you know, we've, we've got further discussions to, 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 to take, take place around the partnership, as Piers has outlined, but in terms of constructing the integrated care board, you know, we will have a, you know, we have set aside a, a, a place for, for, for a health watch perspective uh, on, the, on the board because we don't want to lose sight of that. But just to reassure you that that won't be, that won't be the end of the conversation and it's probably just the start, really. Thank you. Could I bring Terry, please? Hi, hi, Gavin. Hi, Piers. Um, I'm Terry Hudson, Chair of Sheffield CCG, and I co-chair the Health and Wellbeing Board here in Sheffield. Um, so you've spoken a little bit about the ICP kind of being the conscious of the new integrated uh, care board and, and asking questions and holding the ICB to account for the delivery of some of its plans. How do you see the relationship between the ICB and local health and wellbeing boards and the role that local health and wellbeing boards have in holding commissioners uh, and commissioning and planning to account through the ICB? Uh, well, first of all, you're a critical role, Terry, number one. Secondly, is we, are, we haven't talked a lot today, just partly the way the conversation's gone, but our determination to see a lot of devolution towards place. Gavin talked about a place director on the board. Not all ICBs have done that. We think that's a bit of evidence of us taking place more seriously than others. And it, Health and Wellbeing Board would be a critical part of place working really effectively. Forget place. Of Sheffield working really effectively with a place director for Sheffield and Health and Wellbeing Board will have a role of scrutiny around the role around that. And so I think that's a, it's a critical responsibility. 
um, we do not in any way want to undermine the health and wellbeing boards at all, one. Two, we want to increase the possibility of doing more in Sheffield rather than at a South Yorkshire footprint. Um, but we will be challenging to Sheffield to say, let's look at your plans, let's make them robust, let's make them particular. But actually, the health and wellbeing board is going to have a critical role in all of that, all of it. Thanks. Can, can I bring David in, please? Oh, questions we are going to answer. Can I just see uh, any other questions um, wish to be asked? If I'm not seeing it at this moment, I might just take the opportunity to ask one myself. It can, does really continue along the themes of um, a number of other people. I think um, one general concern, um, say another the public or people in, whether it be elected office or, or, or stakeholders, might have, is if we um, are moving um, the ultimate responsibility for some decisions um, that may currently rest at a Sheffield level towards the South Yorkshire level, um, that may in turn have an impact that for people who are seeking accountability for whether it be poor care or um, an inability to access the right kind of care, uh, that accountability may be, may, may be harder, whether that's uh, I say a patient directly seeking that or through elected representatives or organisations like Health Watch. What can um, the ICB and the, and the ICP do in the way you're set up to ensure that um, people know who ultimately um, is responsible for their care um, and, that, and to the extent that it is possible, they can hold them to account? Thank you. Well, first of all, it's, it's the same as today. It will be the same as today. If, if there are problems with the GP, no offence, they have to deal with the GP, and, and we, will, we will oversee that. If it's a problem with the trusts, they will deal directly with the trusts. But there's something else as well. If you think, if you think here in this Health and Wellbeing Board we are sucking too much authority up, what do you have to tell us? That's not the intention of the ICB. We think an ICB will be most effective if it tackles a, a small number of issues at a system-wide level where it can make a difference and devolves the bulk of the authority to the, to the, to the in our case, the four places and holds the places to account. So let's be clear, we're not writing bank checks and walking away. This will be quite a, a sharp accountability. So there is absolutely no intention of sucking authority upwards. But we also think that there are a number of issues that probably need a wider footprint than Sheffield. Be they workforce is probably one where almost all have said we need to do that differently and we need to do it on a larger footprint. There is little doubt we need to take some strategic capital decisions that are wider than Sheffield. And so there are, we hope we reserve, my words, a small number of issues to be determined on a South Yorkshire footprint. The bulk of this is at place level, but we will be challenging to place about what they achieve. Back to what our answer to Greg, I don't want, I don't want place just to have a broad strategy and achieve nothing. If we're devolving money, we really want to see a difference. You have a right to ask that of us, and I think we have a right to ask that of you. So I hope the relationship is one that is supportive and challenging to each other. You should have the right to challenge us. You know, we're big boys, we'll cope with it. But actually, we will challenge you to deliver a Sheffield footprint, because I think sometimes we haven't had enough of that. One of the problems I see about partnership working is everyone says, partnership's wonderful, but if you never fall out, you've never made really difficult decisions the key to me is that you make some really difficult decisions, you have a bit of a row about it, and you're still working together the next day. Because when you make choices, you do have those difficult decisions. So we will be not sucking work up, but we will be challenging to you. But you've got a right to challenge us. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Unless um, I'm seeing um, any other questions that want to be asked, I think we're going to close the item. And thank you very much both for coming along. It's been, it's, it, I, I think it's been really valuable. And, Although definitely not going to hold down to come to any particular future meeting at this this moment, I, I really do hope that we um, keep um, you know a very uh, good and intensive uh, um, conversation about the future of uh, this board and, and, and South Yorkshire partnership between us um, and, and and the SCB. Thank you both. We'll just wait a moment uh, until we open the next item. Thanks.
Okay. Um, for our next item um, about the um, voluntary community sector uh, relationships, I think, are we expecting Mark to start? So Mark and Helen are going to jointly start. Um, if, you, if you're more comfortable to come to the centre, you can, or certainly you can stay in your current positions if you, uh, if you wish. I'm very happy staying here if others are happy for me to stay here. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Board. Um, I thought it would be helpful to just do a few introductory remarks about some of the timeline here um, and some of the work that we've undertaken over the last year or so. And then Helen is going to speak more specifically about some of the uh, ways that we've seen, that we've been working across uh, statutory and voluntary organisations um, and the opportunities that that has brought. So by way of timeline, I think it was February last year that Brian Hughes and I took an action from this board to develop a statement of intent for how the voluntary sector and statutory, um, uh, statutory sector relationship could develop. I think that was on, on part on behalf of the Health and Wellbeing Board but also, and I didn't say it at the start, I'm the director of the Sheffield Health and Care Partnership. Um, so we were also keen to develop that, uh, th that uh, statement of ambition, that statement of, uh, of intent as a health and care partnership. And so in the, um, the pack of papers, you've got a copy of the statement of intent that our health and care partnership board agreed in June 2021. It's, it's really good to be able to come back to my, I think it's my first face-to-face -face meeting um, for a very, very long time. So it's, it's lovely to be, to be back in a face-to-face -face meeting um, to, to update on that work and then um, talk about some of the specifics uh, arising. In the um, statement of intent that we developed, we drew quite heavily on a vision for health and care that we had um, uh, agreed a short number of months earlier. And I'm going, there's, there's a sort of longer extract in the, in the pack, but one thing that has really struck with me is the, the, the following sentence, that the voluntary and community sector should be seen as disruptors, challenging the status quo and thinking differently about the delivery of better outcomes with and within communities. Um, and then the sort of statement goes on to sort of talk about this is not just a sort of sub, a, a contractual relationship or a sort of a, a subcontractual relationship. Sometimes it's, there's a fundamental um, importance and role that voluntary and community organisations can bring in a partnership such as, uh, as ours that we need to recognise, celebrate and grow and strengthen as well. That same vision has got three strands to it and those three strands quite reminiscent of what Pierce and Gavin have just been talking about, but um, first and foremost is an emphasis on inequalities, on integration, and on people. And on all three of those pillars, I think we see a critical role that the voluntary and community sector can, can and, 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 and must play. So on inequalities, I'm um, talking about those sort of different models, different modes of delivery, and in particular that connection and reach that voluntary and community organisations can bring with different parts of our city, with different communities, which sometimes our statutory organisations are less good at. On integration, um, if we're really serious about the full um, potential of potential of holistic health, care and well-being, then that stretches far beyond um, traditionally defined primary care or secondary care or just health and social care. It's integrating voluntary services, voluntary sector with statutory provision as full partners. And then thirdly, on that strand around people, um, when, and, and this has been a consistent theme for us as a, as a health and care partnership, we have always said that when we talk about our workforce, we are not just talking about our statutory workforce, we're talking about those working in and those volunteering for vo voluntary and community organisations very much as part of the wider Team Sheffield. I was struck when um, I think Gavin um, said that the, the, in that sort of fourth strand around anchor institutions, a workforce of 70,000 or so. In Sheffield, we've talked about 60,000 workforce across health care and voluntary organisations. So there's a, there's a wider workforce and, and, um, uh, and staff uh, piece that we can think about here. So, um, so a, a long-term vision for the partnership, uh, which makes clear the role that the voluntary and community organisation and sectors, uh, organisations and sector can play. 
That statement of intent described five different areas of development. I won't go through them in, in, in depth, um, but, but briefly they covered the role um, around coordination and leadership, so how we support the connection, coordination and, and leadership of a, of a diverse and, and, and complex voluntary, voluntary sector. Um, a, a strand around delivery, I've mentioned it already, that otherness, um, that, that um, disruption, um, different ways of working uh, with and within communities, so there's a delivery role here. There is an important point about financial security, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about that, but we need to recognise the challenge of uh, financial precarity that many voluntary community organisations face, so what can we do to support and enable some of that longer term resilience and, and security? That statement of intent also talks about voice, so listening to, respecting, responding to voluntary and community organisations themselves, but also looking at VCSE organisations as voice organisations, as representative organisations in their own right. And then fifthly, the fifth pillar we talked about was shared learning and experience. So really getting into that joint planning, joint delivery, co-production space, not uh, necessarily a, a, a more traditional um, um, sort of commissioning, uh, commissioning provision space. So, so what can we do to, to develop that uh, and that strand? There's a table in the pack which takes each of those five headings in turn um, and then identifies some quite specific work, specific actions under each of those different headings. And there's a group of people now looking at that much more um, uh, specifically to ensure that we are doing the things that we have said we must do um, and, um, and, and uh, exploring whether that sort of more detailed specific table is, is still the right set of specific things to be doing uh, and progressing that work. So I've spoken a bit from the perspective of the health and care partnership. Um, there are some questions in the paper for the health and wellbeing board. Um, I think there is perhaps a question about whether that is a model um, that the health and wellbeing board might like to see developed in other organizations, other, um, other bodies, other structures. Um, so that, that there's, a, there's a question there that the board might want to consider. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that this is all now working perfectly or brilliantly. There are absolutely still challenges, um, and this is a, a long journey that we're on. Um, I think um, we, we, we do know that it's one thing to write a statement of intent, a statement of ambition. It's another thing to then deliver it. Um, and so um, that once you get into the, the delivery of that ambition and the specifics here, um, it, it does get tricky and it is hard, but there are instances of our relationship changing um, and of things improving. Helen, do you want to talk a bit more about some of those specific examples? Thank you. Yeah, so thanks, Mark. Um, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, progress, not just with this dialogue, but actually with the relationships. And I think that as a city, what we have got is a really good set of partnership um, working arrangements um, and that comes out of a number of years of building those relationships and, and doing some some really like innovative and um, really strong partnership work um, there are definitely some issues and I won't, I won't kind of focus on that because I think there are some some really good examples of how we work together I think in t just in, in how we develop this work what is like uppermost in a lot of VCS organizations minds at the moment is the nature of commissioning and I think that it plays really well into the city conversation about how we want to commission as a city that we're not just um, wanting to sort of go forward and, and see that as a route for funneling money but actually it's about planning and it's about a focus for investment in priorities and I think that's really key when we're dealing with these like concepts like health inequalities which means everything to everybody that we've got a really good investment plan and we've got a focus which involves bringing in lots of types of understanding and um, so yeah I think a priority that, that we keep coming back to in this is that the, the VCS are part of the system leadership there is some way to go to, to get there, but I think there are some spaces where we've got really good examples of where that's happening. And one example being that, you know, the VCS is leading some work um, to look at diabetes and developing community upwards intelligence about what is important in, in addressing some of the, the 
the inequalities around diabetes, the, the groups of people who are furthest away from, from actually controlling their levels and are seeing rates escalating. That's, that's worked where the BCS is actually leading the city and working with the statutory system to develop the intelligence and to develop um, a case for further investment. And that's happened because we work as a partnership and um, we've been given that support to do it. It wouldn't have happened three years ago, I don't think. So we're in, a, we're in a different place in terms of the role of the BCS as leaders. And there are some really um, strong examples of commissioning, like the Changing Futures Commissioning, which actually works in a, in a partnership way and it takes a partnership approach to people who face multiple complex barriers and challenges um, out of the council and into a collective way of managing this sort of cross system approach. Um, there, are, there are numerous examples. I think we can, you know, we can look at what happened during COVID and the, the way that the BCS worked collectively with the vaccination board and, and others to get messages out. It shows that we've got really strong partnerships and we can we can move to like to work together in a in a way that we've got a much more equal leadership. But I think there is still a long way to go in terms of the way that we commission the BCS. There are some there are some challenges, and I think that that's where we we could do more, and we could do more as a as a collective to agree some principles. I think there's a conversation around joint commissioning, which I'm starting to have, and I think that that's a place. I'm looking at you, Terry, but that's a place where actually we can really develop some of that that conversation. So, as well as the co the questions that Mark's flagged, I think. I've got a question, which is, do you want me to work with you to take that further within the Health and Wellbeing Board? I think, I think I'd think i like to throw in an extra bonus question, if that's okay. Um, and just to, just to kind of flag also that within this, there is a, a sort of wider, there's a wider set of connections that the BCR, BCS have. And it just, just made me think when Piers were talking about intelligence and data, and actually we've, we've got some really good um, intelligence and data that we we already we already know about we've got community embedded organizations we've also got organizations like health watch who have got really you know really embedded relationships and really good data sources so i just think we need to we need to kind of start exploring more broadly how we work together and how we make use of our assets and i'll stop now thank you Thank you very much, both Mark and Helen, for that. I mean, obviously, we've got a number of um, notes and recommendations um, in the paper, you know, particularly on, um, you know, what are thoughts thoughts here, what was here, but also, I think, particularly in terms of what you said, Helen, you know, where do we want this to go next? How can, you know, not just the board, but other organisations that feed into it, you know, feed into it, support this, and um, what, you know, what do we want to see, see next? So... With that, can I bring Terry in, please? Thank you, um, both Mark and uh, Helen, for, for presenting that paper. Um, I welcome the paper. I think uh, having read that several times before um, coming to the meeting this afternoon, um, I welcome that there, there is that strategic steer in the paper. Um, I, I welcome your question, Helen, in particular, about kind of well, what, what do we do in the future landscape? Um, and I think it's a question as, as commissioners, and indeed, actually, it will be the future commissioners um, after the CCGs uh, dissolve that we need to think about this question very carefully. Um, and that's to what extent does the commissioner value the voices of voluntary organisations and communities in our planning and in our prioritisation, and indeed in our building services um, moving forwards. And I'm just thinking more broadly than um, just health. Um, so our title is a health and well-being board. Um, and we know that voluntary and community organizations play a very key role in um, developing well-being, building well-being in, in communities. Um, and I just wonder whether either of you had got any particular thoughts on how we look at that beyond the health and care partnership and actually um, what would be the strategic role in, in a health and well-being space more broadly um, in terms of affecting some of the social determinants of health. When this statement of intent was written last year, um, and I can't remember exactly who brought it up, it may well have been Judy, I'm looking at, at Judy over there, particular, and it may have been Maddie 
uh, Deforge um, from, from, from Vaz previously, um, had really flagged up um, not just the need for strategic relationships to strengthen, um, but a lot about that financial position. Um, and one of the things that George and I asked for um, as co-chairs was obviously for that statement of intent to be produced, um, and then some point in the future to um, hear a bit more about some of the progress. And I think um, it was really helpful to hear some of those examples, Helen, um, but I've still got this question burning in my mind at the moment, is have we moved beyond the intent? So to what extent do you feel that we've moved beyond the intent in the paper to actually being able to achieve some of those things. Um, and it may be we, we have a bit of a deeper dive on that in the future in terms of bringing forward some of the examples. Obviously, they're not included in, in the paper here, but I think there are um, plenty I can think of um, that there would be good ways of working. I think it would be a good way of uh, kind of bringing them into our strategic thinking if we could share the good examples as well. Shall I come back on that? Thank you, Terry, and that's that's really helpful. Um, you, uh, your first question was about you know where are the where are the opportunities, and particularly in the health inequality space. I think that the the intelligence and the sort of data and insights. So in Vaz, we're working hard to bring a much more kind of robust and centralised data and intelligence um, function to to connect into the the, the other other kind of existing data and intelligence functions um, but part of that is like individual individual insight and I think that the opportunity is to be really targeted and to be really nuanced in terms of how we set priorities as a city and how we shape South Yorkshire priorities because I think that type of insight can be really powerful and it can actually ensure that we we invest in a way that is getting to the root of, of issues. I know that there are so many different, what we call wider determinants, but they're like big things, aren't they? Housing, I mean, what do we do about housing? How do we play that into, into the conversation? Um, but I think there's also a movement within within communities to, to do more around health creation. And I think that we should be talking about health creation. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of opportunity, but I think just going on to your second question, um, things have moved. I, I've got so many doors open to me, I don't know which ones to go through. So I think that that's a, a massive, like, I think it's a massive bonus for Sheffield. And I know, I've been sort of worked for a couple of years with leaders in other parts of the South Yorkshire footprint. The VCS in other, in other parts of South Yorkshire maybe don't have as much of a kind of joint leadership approach as we do. But that's at a, a particular level, and I'm not sure that that's really percolating down to other other layers of the the system. Um, and I think that there's just a there's just a real sort of limiter in terms of how money's going. I think there's a value that's recognised, but there's not a sustainable investment in organisations to exist. So, in order to respond to another crisis, those organisations need to exist, and I think we need to find a way to allow those organisations to exist that goes beyond sort of short-term funding investment. And I think that's really critical that we we find a way to do that. So, yeah, <clears throat> I would welcome a, a deep dive into like how we, how we get past where we are now. Can I, can I just come back on one part of uh, Terry's question? So you, you were sort of asking whether there are specific other places for uh, the similar conversations might have, I think, that it was part of your question. So, so we're taking some of this forward within the health and care partnership. Are there other routes and other avenues that we might want to explore? Um, I think there's a question about whether the statement of intent type of approach is, is a useful and helpful one. If it is, um, then there are other places that we could explore. The Health and Wellbeing Board might ask local area committees. Um, Mayoral combined authority. Think about the invitation from Pierce just now to challenge the future ICB. Is this type of statement of intent something that we would want the ICB to have? Um, the Joint Commissioning Committee, and I know there are conversations there, maybe organisations themselves, so individual or sovereign organisations having similar sorts of statements of intent. So I can see there are absolutely places kind of within and beyond that health and care partnership that could absolutely develop something like this. The first question is important, of course. 
only worth doing if we think this type of approach does then lead to change and, and, and impact. But um, I can see a number of places where we might take it. Thanks, Terry, for your question, and both Helen and Mark for those really interesting responses. And I absolutely think that um, it has raised a, a number of questions which we need to c come back to in perhaps different ways. Um, can I bring Greg in, please? Thanks, George. Um, so uh, the, the answer to both questions, uh, is this sufficient assurance and do, you, do, do we want you to be further involved in this is yes, as far as I'm concerned, there's only for both. Uh, quick, quick thought, I think VCS in Sheffield is a really strong sector. I think we all know we'd be in a really, really bad place without the intervention of the sector, you know, most obviously and very visibly recently COVID, but way beyond that and way after that. So uh, that's kind of a given. Um, there's something about the um, coming back to the master-servant relationship, we've just got to get over ourselves on that one, to be honest. There's something about the funder versus investor um, and the level playing field issue that, that I think we just need to, to face up to, to be honest, and get over ourselves. Mark, you mentioned the sort of the, or maybe Helen, the, the sovereign organisations and building this into the machinery of our organisations at all levels, not just the high level conversation at the partnership. Uh, that, I think, is where the deal breaker is in some of, some of this stuff. Um, um, the, the thing I'd really push on is the sort of the Nothing to disagree with. I like it, love it, think it's great. Um, test it to destruction with some real-life scenarios. Um, really, really test it to destruction and then learn from it because that's the way we improve it and that's the way I think we build it into the machinery of all of the sovereign organisations that are involved in all of the partnerships. Not just health, not just well-being. I'd go to sort of skills, crime, children, young people. Wherever you want to go, I think this is the, the right way to go, but we've got to build it into the machines of our organisations. Otherwise, it will be a nice statement. I'll stop there. Thank you. I don't know if you want a particular response from, from, from that, Greg, or, or not particularly. That's, that, that's fine. Can we bring Sandy in, please? Thank you. Um, obviously, I support the paper because obviously I contributed to it. Um, one of the recommendations talks about the <coughs> Sheffield Outcomes Framework coming to the Health and Wellbeing Board, and I know that you've been heavily involved, both of you, in, in, in development of that. I think one of the plea is... Um, that whatever we um, sign up to and agree in regards to the uh, engagement of voluntary sector in, in any organisation, that it's actually aligned and actually work together and because we're all trying to uh, achieve the same outcomes in that delivery and it's making sure that it does have that central place within Sheffield and, and where we can then bring that and align that work. So in terms of that recommendation, it's about bringing together the data that you were talking about, that population health management information, the feedback um, in order to inform progress delivery and the commissioning intentions. Um, and on a side point, completely agree with your point about sustainability of funds. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Lee, please. Yes, thank you. Um, again, really welcome this paper. I was just thinking about it. Um, I only saw a sight of these papers just before the meeting because I only realised I was coming just before the meeting. Um, so I've not had a lot of time to think about it. But um, it just strikes me that this is more of that evidence of a cultural shift in the way of working. Um, and, and I think that's really, really important because I think we, you know, referring back to our previous conversation, you know, we can get very stuck in our ways of working and think this is the way it has to be. And because that's what government says, this is the way it has to be. And those are the targets we have to meet. And we know it's completely inadequate if we really want to change lives, change communities, reduce inequalities. We've got to think completely differently. And, and this is all about, it strikes me, of investing in communities um, and not doing too but enabling strengths and assets to be enhanced and come to the fore. And that's all about then developing confidence and connection and control and all the things that we know will make people well. So this is really, I don't need to tell you this, but it's really, really important. Um, and I just, I just noticed something that you said, Helen, about, of course, there's always problems with, well, not always, there are problems commissioning in this space. Um, and I thought, yeah, there's big problems commissioning with primary care and there's big problems commissioning with secondary care. But we sort of accept those because we live with them. But because this is a new space, we might, you know, be more sensitive to them. When actually, I think this is a space where, where there's a real opportunity to do things very differently when we think about commissioning. And, and particularly if we want to think about outcomes, do you know, let's just make sure they're the right outcomes. Are these the ones that the communities that we're working with or the, the, that we're working in um, actually want? Are they the right ones? Because if we get that right, then actually that will improve health and it will improve life, people's experience and life chances and, and all the rest. So I think, I suppose my plea is to be as radical as we dare, you know, and to be as courageous as we dare, because this, 
this is the bit of the game changer, really, isn't it? The way that we commission in this space. Um, I think there's, there's lots more I could say about it, but I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Um, can we Judy in now, please? Yeah, thank you, George. I really welcome this paper. It's great to see something that we worked on some time ago coming back to reality. And those issues around commissioning and money and all those things are really important. Um, and I, I, I think it's good to see there is a good development there. Just, just a couple of, uh, something about further points, a couple of further points I wanted to bring in. I think there's something about, as well as voice, a recognition that this is about citizenship. It's about people being able to do things for themselves. It may not involve commissioning in any way. And I always say, you think about a choir or a walking group or a brownie pack. They don't want to be commissioned, but they do want to work in an ecosystem that understands them, that thinks about, is there a church hall? Is there a place to meet? Some really basic things. And I think that needs working into this. Um, and that will be an additional point. But I think the other one, in terms of this board, with its wide links into uh, the city and the way it works, uh, and Mark hinted at that, about seeing engagement and working with communities as part of our new way of doing democracy. Seems to me that it needs to be written in there. Uh, and I think there's quite a long way to go on that because <laughs> we talk about, I talk to Piers and Gavin about engagement. Um, I know from Health Watch the engagement plan for the ICB is really short. So we have a great paper about all these things. The reality often is quite different. So citizenship, people doing things independently and with their own agency, and then that whole thing about the reality in terms of engagement. I would just want to add, I'm really pleased to see the reference to Health Watch. I always have to say, but we're not a voluntary organisation. Thank you. Thanks. Well, can I Sharon, please? Yeah, hi. For those who don't know me, I'm the Chair of Sheffield Health and Social Care NHS Foundation Trust. Um, really um, welcome the paper. It was good to read it. I'm relatively new to the system, only been here about six months. Uh, Mark just mentioned whether it was a, 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 a good approach, whether we could use it again. Uh, having come new to it, I think it is a really good approach. It could be potentially be very powerful. I think in keeping this on the agenda and making sure there's action and some outcome from it, and I think that's the key to it, making sure there is some actually deliverable. So I'm with Terry, really. I thought the paper was really good, but I'm interested in what's happened since last June and challenging us back. Uh, we doing everything we can to make sure that we do actually make forward. So I think bringing it here, talking about the outcomes framework, I think it keeps it on the agenda and it challenges ourselves and taking it to the healthcare partnership will do the same. So hopefully we will challenge all of our own organisations as well to take it up. But I think it's a, it's a really good approach. It just needs, we need to make sure that it delivers on what it should deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, are we seeing any more questions? If we're not, the paper, I think, you know, there's a few things, you know, you know, we're asked to note, and I think, I think particularly importantly, I hope that um, Mark and Helen, you feel that some of the contributions today um, have been, well, from my point of view, you know, quite useful in um, suggesting other areas we need to go to. And I, I also think the, um, the mention of the um, she uh, Sheffield's outcome framework was, um, was, was timely and important in the paper and in the discussion. Um, I'll slightly plug that in my substantive role, I guess. Um, but I think that actually um, ensuring that um, not only that do we monitor that and, 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 and have some oversight of that here, but also in hold that to account in the way that it actually um, is structured and set up um, to understand and help, and help us understand um, the value and, and the impact of our sector, um, because ultimately it's our, it's our tool, um, it, you know, and hopefully it can um, help us as a city where perhaps some other metrics and things that um, perhaps might spring from either uh, health or local government, I believe don't always pick up um, the value of the um, sector and actually help us um, 
um, challenge ourselves ar ar around the impact on the sector and, 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 and how we are working strategically with that voluntary sector. So um, I absolutely very much um, endorse Chef's out framework in that way. Is there any other point anyone wants to make on this item? Um, Terry? So I was just building on what you've, you've said, George, about this being our tool. Um, and, and I would just like to see, I, and, and I think we've got this, Helen, but that it's a collective, collectively owned tool with the voluntary sector. And um, we absolutely need to be positioning ourselves to be held to account against this by voluntary organizations. So we need to make sure that um, we have empowered our community, voluntary faith organizations to be able to ask those difficult questions back of us, particularly through the lens of this framework. Thanks, Terry. I know when we were first setting up the, the outcomes framework, the engagement initially from um, the, um, the voluntary community sector was fantastic. Um, and we need to make sure that, you know, that two-way relationship absolutely continues. So I think that's definitely worth noting. Is there anything else anyone wants to say on this paper other than um, I ask people just to, you know, um, look at, um, you know, the recommendations at item six in the paper um, and, you know, um, I hope we can um, all a sense of those, really. Um, Greg. Uh, so I agree with that. I think in terms of the, the coming back, you need to guide us if we haven't, we being a collective, pretty, pretty widely, haven't lived up to the aspirations that you set out and hold, hold us to it because we'll doubtless fail. So uh, tell us when we've failed and then we can continue to improve. Thanks, Ray. I think it's a good suggestion. What, I, what I'm going to suggest is that, um, it, it, is that we fairly quickly establish um, what the next sort of point the board uh, wants to interact with this um, and also particularly other organizations that you know members of the board are, are part of does and um, we really make sure we get to that really quickly um, so that it doesn't get um, bogged down or, 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 or delayed too much. Um, David. Sorry, just, just uh, it might be on the same point actually. I, I'm, I'm keen that once everything's been reshuffled in terms of uh, the NHS uh, commissioning side of things, uh, that this, this comes back for discussion because I think there might be a few new faces, different faces at Health and Wellbeing Board, and I think that I want the new guard to, to really carry on and uh, carry on with this. So, could we get that on, you know, sort of... Yeah, I, I think obviously right in terms of, I mean, it's very difficult to know exactly what the, what, what the exact sweet spot is beyond, beyond July, say, to bring it back up, but I think absolutely the, the, the steering committee needs to consider what the right time to bring this, bring this back is. Terry, do you want to make a comment? Um, so, just sort of, it was almost building on my, my original question, um, which is uh, really having a bit of a deeper dive into some of the progress we've made already. Um, and I think we could probably do that fairly quickly. I think the information's there. Um, I'm obviously mindful of the work that goes into building up a presentation and a discussion. Um, but ideally, George, I'd like to see that come back to the next public meeting, um, if possible. So that would give us three months. Um, and then I just take on board David's point afterwards is as the, the, the and we're, I think we're getting onto this in a later item, um, the makeup of this board changes. I think we need to revisit it so that it is fresh in the memories of those people that are, are, are joining the board in the future and it doesn't, um, almost building on, on Piers' thing, become part of one of our strategic things that goes on a shelf and someone reinvents the wheel in a couple of years. We've been through that cycle as a city and, uh, and you know, no doubt other, other places will have been through that cycle as well. So let's keep this in our corporate memory. Let's keep it in our partnership memory as we move forwards. Can I could I just come in as well? Um, sure. I think there is a dynamic to this, which is that the BCS are actually on the ICB. So there is a BCS place on the on the ICB, which is it brings a different. I think it brings a different kind of um, power dynamic or a different kind of relationship, which needs to sort of be built into. I think it's, it's the same for every sector, every organisation. But um, yeah, I think it would be really helpful to come back to that once we get to the other side, because. I don't think anybody really quite knows which, which bit to look at or who to like, who to kind of focus on first. So, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly hearing a very strong, um, a, a, a very strong opinion from, the, from various board members to bring it back soon in public, whether that's an next board meeting or, or at a point just after, you know, this, this, the formal establishment of the um, ICB board. We, we can work that out, but it's certainly within um, a very uh, short period of time anyway, unless we're seeing dissent from that. 
I think that's you know good agreement there. So um, thank you both Mark and, and Helen for that item. It's really helpful and we'll um, you know return to this very soon. Thank you. Just give a moment for Mark to leave. Our next item we've got is um, um, an update on our um, on our health and well-being board review, and I think Greg, Greg, you wanted to briefly introduce this item, didn't you? Is that correct? Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, George. Um, so I'll start, but I'll quickly hand over to Lucy, who did most of the hard work. Um, it's a hygiene page, a hygiene paper, but but with a reasonably substantial shift in the ways of working in the board proposed, so, so do pay attention until the end. Um, based on a review that was done December to February uh, this year, um, we occasionally do those reviews, and this, this, this kind of summarises that. Um, to, 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 to cut to the chase, um, the three broad recommendations are to, to formally maintain the uh, formal quarterly committee meetings, but, but really, really push and load up the agenda with uh, updates on intelligence, updates on some of the good things and some of the problems that are happening day in, day out in Sheffield to uh, give you a chance to steer it, but secondly, to know what's going on because the, the, the city is full of plenty of good news stories as well as bad stuff. Secondly, um, to uh, uh, cancel the current monthly strategy meeting so you get more time in your diaries. Uh, the cost of that will be three reasonably substantial half-day workshops where we use the convening power of the board to really focus on some big, sprawling, messy, wicked issues um, and to bring new voices into the room um, and to use the uh, health and wellbeing board convening power to kind of have different conversations about some of the big, some of the big arguably the wicked issues. And third one is our latest status quo, but to keep the steering group in its current form. So those are the three main recommendations. If I just briefly go through what my take on the key findings are. Um, scope of the board, um, everyone agrees that the Health and Wellbeing Board should focus on fluids in the title, health and well-being, um, uh, uh, and not NHS and social care integration. I think uh, everyone agrees on that one. We need to live that dream. Um, interestingly, since this was done, the government levelling up white paper has come out with one of the objectives is uh, narrowing the gap in healthy life expectancy, which is exactly the same as the strategy that we've got. So there's some interesting space there. Um, an all-age um, board, um, not just adults, we've gravitated towards adults and we've tended to underplay children and that matters, that matters a lot. Um, functions, um, statutory functions of the board served perfectly well. Uh, we shouldn't forget the wider functions of the board. Um, um, methods, um, people responding to Lucy thought that we were pretty, pretty light on follow-up actions and decisions and pro pro probably some work to do there in terms of making sure that we uh, um, program manage some of that stuff better and probably better, better, could do better on co-production. Um, membership, talked about all age already. Um, there's something about are we asking members of the boards to represent organisations or represent constituencies of professions, people, functions. Um, in my head, it's always been the latter but it's hard not to also represent organisations as uh, come, come as the default. Um, uh, there, there was a fairly strong view of a widened set of membership, um, a fairly strong view that the board, this board currently is fairly heavy with statutory sector partners um, uh, and, and we need to strengthen the voluntary and community sector partnership and bring new voices, new voices there. Um, obviously, the challenge is the bigger the board becomes, the more hard it is to manage. It becomes an assembly, not a board. Um, um, uh, something about um, the relationship with other bodies, the partnership world and all of our statutory organisations are continually evolving and the board needs to continue to, 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 to make sure it's got optimal relationships with other bodies, that some of which can arguably do some of the functions better. There's a sweet spot that only this group of people can do. Um, uh, ultimately, we want the Health and Wellbeing Board to be responsible for clues in the title, health and wellbeing, and the strategy already reflects that, and I shall come on to that in a minute. Um, so um, um, th that's a sort of a, a summary of, of where Lucy got to. Um, uh, why? Uh, I think it's timely to reinvigorate um, the board. It's, it's good hygiene to review these things from occasion anyway. Um, as we come out of the COVID fog, it's, it's very, very timely to reinvigorate the board and its mission and its purpose and better enable it to fulfill its mission, which is quite a difficult one. Um, I'll pause for breath. Lucy, what did I miss? Um, yeah, I think Greg has given quite a good overview of the kind of key findings. I think um, coming on to kind of what we were suggesting, I think there was a few kind of reasons given in the paper of why we've 
kind of um, chosen to shift to this three-day half conference event. Um, and I think one of the things that came up was um, for me in, in the interviews was um, the board having something to kind of grip hold of and, and, and those events kind of as well as a kind of annual look back and look forward um, session would give the board an opportunity to prioritise some of its attention um, on, on something um, that sits beneath the, the joint health and wellbeing strategy. Um, another thing that came up quite a lot was this, um, the point around engagement and kind of how we, the voices of, of people in Sheffield influence the board work. And we think hopefully by having these bigger events, which hopefully have a wider membership, we'll be able to have a, a wider range of voices shaping those conversations. Um, and it would provide a way for kind of that lived experience to come into the discussions without it being concentrated on a, a few kind of um, small number of people. Um, in terms of the kind of resources, we'll be able to kind of funnel those towards um, the, the, a smaller number of events, but really focus on making those good um, and, and really kind of meaningful um, rather than spreading out over the monthly meetings. Um, and as Greg said, just kind of give a fresh impetus in light of coming out of COVID, the changes to NHS, changes to um, Sheffield City Council governance structures as well, um, and just provide that kind of signal of change and refresh to the board's work. Um, we do kind of propose that there would be some changes in membership in light of these changes, but I think we need to kind of figure out what um, is happening with the ICS governance arrangements before we can really um, pin those down. So we've just put a few kind of principles that we'd want membership to to kind of reflect in the future and and one of those as Greg mentioned would be around having a, a wider um, increase in proportion of voices with a focus on children and young people because it does seem to be a bit more of a focus on adults um, at the moment um, and the thing around kind of co-chairing arrangements as well that that we will need to figure out over the next couple of months um, and then the final thing was around kind of deputies and the, the need to have a kind of clear named deputy um, who comes to the board if, if, if people um, can't and attend themselves. Um, and we've also said for the for the, the smaller mini conference events, um, board members should be really be kind of ambassadors for those events uh, and make sure that people who are attending those are the right people um, and contribute and, and take away action. Um, for delivery and, and we can hopefully at that kind of as as we said before that annual look forward and look back session reflect on some of the things that the board's done over the years which is something that came up quite a lot in the interview interviews was around that kind of um, accountability and, and being able to follow through on action so hopefully that will be a way for us um, to do that um, there's a few questions in the paper as well as recommendations but yeah really that 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 was the, the main things I wanted to cover. I don't know if you've got anything else, Greg. Thanks both Greg and Lucy for running through all that. That's pretty comprehensive, I think. Um, ask a question, but first that we can bring Terry in, please. So uh, thanks for presenting that, Greg and um, Lucy. Thank you for all of the work and the interviews and a uh, you know, substantial amount of effort that went into um, bringing together you know, 20 plus different opinions is hard work, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, I just wanted to draw out a couple of bits um, that, that I really want to commend in this paper. So we've just spent some time on the previous item talking about the value um, that Community Voice brings to our discussions, um, and I think the conference type events that are proposed in, in this paper um, give us a different opportunity, they give us a, a, a different way of potentially doing things. Um, the one thing I think we, we, we can all agree on is we don't have the answers to everything in this room. But actually, the more people we ask the question of, the closer we might get to finding an answer to something. So I think this gives us um, a different way of engaging with communities that we had previously grappled with um, to, to find a way. So that's the first thing I just wanted to draw out um, on, on the answers. Um, the, the, the second bit there is um, if we don't have the answers, are we asking ourselves the right questions? And again, I think the, the conference style events where we've got much broader membership there is good. 
One thing I, I may have missed in the paper just on that is um, we have had discussions before about whether we hold them here or is there, is there, is there scope and is there um, a real benefit in this board going out to communities and, and doing our business in, in different places. So I think that's something that we might want to consider as we move forwards. Um, the final bit, um, just around really beefing up the, the more formal public meetings. I'm, I'm in agreement with that, um, but I think, Greg, your point on programme managing that is really important um, because sometimes we do discuss things and they slip by the wayside and there's something really important about bringing and, and closing that loop back up. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say on those bits. In terms of the questions, um, I, I, I think the answer is to yes to all three of them and I can accept the recommendations. Thanks, Terry, for those thoughts on the paper. That's really helpful. Can I bring Greg quickly back in before we have more questions and comments? Thanks. Sure. Uh, do, yeah, yes, come back. Uh, on the programme management, I agree completely. It's my principal risk, uh, principal risk and principal worry. I, I've asked my team, um, both kind of the admin function and my, my kind of t the, 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 the specialist team, to be to be much, much, much more focused on helping do some of that stuff. And that won't wholly solve the problem, but it will help. And on the uh, should we not have meetings and conferences here, uh, yes, I really, really, really want to be on tour. I've had all the merch printed up, everything. It's all ready to go. Um, so, uh, but, 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 yes. Um, the first of those sessions is on the 21st of June and it's on the housing health interface. It'll be a facilitated workshop and Susan and my team's organising it with all of the right people and I'm, I'm almost certain it's not here. Thank you. Obviously the Director of Public Health hasn't organised a session as outlined in the paper. We haven't signed off yet, but obviously. But, uh, 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 <laughs> but thank you, Gwen. That's really helpful, actually. Um, I've got um, Helen, uh, please. Yeah, it's just just to say, Lucy, thank you so much, and, and Greg. Um, I think there's there's a lot of stuff happening in Sheffield, isn't there, around um, democracy, participatory engagement, and decision making, and there's there's a sort of developing dialogue about what good looks like in that space in terms of getting, and it sort of links to what you were saying, Judy, about citizenship and and what that looks like, and and actually, um, I guess I've got a question which is. How genuinely, like, how genuinely driven are we with reaching as many people and getting as many people engaged with this board? And if so, how do we build in some of the lessons that are being developed around what that kind of really good democratic engagement looks like? And is there a kind of is there a will to really get into that level of discussion about you know not just what space we hold the meetings in, but actually should it be a meeting? Should it be something else that's used to? bring voices in and to connect people with it. I know that's like a, it's one of those big problems, isn't it, that you were talking about, Greg, but I think that there's something really like key about the principles of how we go about this that we need to consider. Thanks, Helen. I think it's a really good challenge question. I mean, Greg, do you, do you want to particularly try and address that or? Um, uh, so um, do, do, do we want uh, uh, more voices, more people? Yes. Uh, are we very good at the sort of the interface between health and well-being and democratic, uh, de de democratic um, kind of involvement? No, probably not, to be honest. So uh, see, see me after class. I think I'm the me that needs to see me after class. Um, you can always get better in that space. On, on the sort of the pub the public meetings, whether they be meetings, workshops, whatever we want to call them, I very much don't see them as a meeting in a public place that might be in um, uh, a, a community centre somewhere in Leedless to pick somewhere. Uh, I would very much see it as a two-way two conversation where we collectively come up with uh, answers to problems that we maybe even haven't even anticipated yet. Um, that needs organising, sorting, and, uh, and needs careful thought through, but I very, very, very much don't see it as a, a, a version of this kind of meeting but in a public place. Just to, yeah, just to come back on that to say, I think we've we've got a number of activities, particularly around local area committees and other other engagement type activities, where I think we can help to build good practice around that. Thank you. I'll just before bring the other people in. I'll just add also that, of course, one thing we need to think about here is the interaction with um, the work we're doing around our, our, our engagement plan and, and that sort of thing. So it is both about the way and. It, very valid points about the, the, the way we do our business. And I wouldn't say meetings, because you know, there's a number of other, you know, number of strategies to take, but also how do we um, help people um, not just understand what we do, but really shape what we do um, in the kind of day-to-day, -day, not just at set piece events. And I think that's why engagement strategy is also 
really important but incredibly valid point. Um, can I bring in Ben, please? Hi, uh, uh, for anyone that doesn't know me, it's my first meeting. So my name is Ben Kemp. I'm a superintendent for neighbourhoods and partnerships in Sheffield District and I've replaced the outgoing Simon Verrill who fortunately for him has retired. Um, so the, a couple of questions and observations from me really is, uh, I know speaking to Simon that he was really welcoming of this review um, and I really do support the concept of it being uh, moving to a conference model, uh, becoming more mobile and visible within communities and providing uh, various stakeholders, not necessarily at a strategic level but at all levels to engage and influence uh, discussions that take place through this board. One of the things that I'd observe as a non-health uh, partner is the complexity and uh, the disparate nature of health and well-being provision across Sheffield and uh, I attend in, in my current capacity four different meetings with health and well-being within the title, some with a dedicated focus on children, some with a dedicated focus on adult. Um, actually mapping those out and understanding the interdependencies between each one, understanding where governance and, uh, and performance oversight sits is really important. And that's really important for two reasons. The first, because it allows partners to bring the intelligence and data that we talk about that's going to allow us to feed up to the Sheffield-wide partnership and significant strategic change. And the second is because it allows uh, the voluntary sector, it allows stakeholders from local area committees to really understand where they need to direct their specific concerns and challenges and where they are holding uh, their um, their public servants to account through service delivery and it's recommended within the document but has not been touched on any of the discussions yet but I think it's a really critical part. No, I, th I, I, think, I, think, I think that is really important. I don't know if anyone wants to respond directly there but I think absolutely what one thing that from my point of view as um, one of the co-chairs of this board um, is that um, there is both a strength um, and a challenge to the fact that everyone that attends here um, comes to so many different forums um, and uh, has so much on as, as you want. And so um, trying to make sure that um, we can um, make the absolute you know, best use, um, but also um, try not to either duplicate or um, repeat you know, things is it, it, really important. But I think your points are, 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 are really good. Thank you. Can I bring David, please? Uh, I'd realize that I think there are strangers I've not introduced myself to. Hi, I'm David Warwick. I'm a GP. Uh, I work on the CCG's governing body. <clears throat> I was thinking about Helen's point about the uh, democracy side of things, but I was also thinking about it's important that for these, um, the uh, conference-style meetings that we do cast the net wider and bring in more people, but I I'm also, rem also remember that that net won't be cast in the same direction each time. And so, there, and, and I like the idea of there being a theme and then and, and someone, be it the steering group or, or us that attend this meeting, need to be good at engaging the right people, who, you know, interested parties and experts, you know, uh, you know uh, and, and it's not as much as about getting that same cross section of society or, or you know, of the population every time. But I think uh, it's, it, we need to build that into this, this idea that who, whose job it is to, to get the right people to that, uh, to that conference. Thanks. Thanks, David. Can we bring Terry again, please? So I just want to come back on that point, David, and, and perhaps build on it. Um, so in, in previous times, probably pre-pandemic, um, when Health and Wellbeing Board was a much more well-oiled machine, um, we, we would have individuals, and, and Greg will be able to remind me exactly uh, what, what we call them, but individual members of this board would take responsibility for set areas. Um, again, I don't think this paper suggests that we do that in terms of uh, one of the ambitions. That's how it used to work. But there is something, as you say, if we're going to go to different types of events and we're casting our nets in different directions, I, I, I think the point that I want to build on what you've said there is it isn't enough for us as a board collectively to sponsor that, but we might need to ask individuals within this board to be taking some ownership of working with whoever's organizing a particular theme. So that, that, that's my point. I don't, you know, it, it isn't just for us to say, great, we'll get Greg to organize all of the events. I think we, we do need to um, put ourselves into the position of supporting that and, and maybe um, individuals taking some slightly closer sponsorship and support. Um, and I suspect Greg and his team would probably welcome that. 
Thank you, Terry. Um, Greg, do you want to come back there? Thank you. Um, I, just, um, I have the list. It's here. Uh, don't we? Don't worry. The list. The list was never lost. Uh, I have the list of who who um, volunteered and who volunteered um, to be the, uh, the sponsors of each of the work streams. Uh, I agree um, uh, uh, in terms of the sort of the casting the net. And there's a different set of stakeholders that would be involved in the conversation about housing to parks, green space, leisure, to NHS, to kind of any of the things that contribute to, um, uh, to, to, to the health and well-being. Uh, and that will be a problem, but I don't think it's an, an irresolvable problem. And I think there are plenty within the city who have a huge amount to contribute just by the work they do day in, day out, that just isn't captured into the narrative and into the conversation. And I think that's the sweet spot that I think we can find. Um, I, I, what I would like, um, whilst I have the mic, the members of the board to suggest is what needs to be on the agenda. What do we want to have themed workshops on? What would you like to hear? Otherwise, it'll be what I think is important to be on uh, formal board meet, uh, formal board agendas and or workshops. So, uh, so do, please do put your thoughts into kind of where you would like us to put our energy and attention and then we can do the organising. Thanks, Greg. I think that probably raises a, a, a wider point, which is how can you know, I'm happy to have feedback here. How, how do board members feel like you either are involved or want to be involved currently in feeding into not just, again, I don't want to say just agendas, um, but various forms of the future work of the board? Um, um, because um, although we would, you know, you know, hand on heart say, you know, um, the door is always open through Dan or through a number of people um, around suggesting items and suggesting th things we should be doing. I don't know necessarily that um, we have been, as a start, just with board members um, and more broadly with a, a, gr a much gr wider group of stakeholders, um, as open and as, as um, well, open sourced, if you like, about the way we. Um, the, 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 the way we plan our business. There are, of course, limitations to that. Of course, there are. We, 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 we know what they are, you know, resource-based resource, resource mostly. Um, but I don't know if board members have particularly thoughts now or, or want to feed and think later about, you know, about fundamentally how we plan our business and who should be involved in that and, and what is the best way of doing that. Because, um, you know, a lot of work does go into planning the board's business, but it, um, it can always absolutely be improved in, in a number of directions. I don't know if there's any, any, any response to Greg's point there or, or anything else um, for the moment. Um, if I'm not seeing any other hands at the moment, I think we really should just turn to you know, what this um, uh, paper um, is really asking us today. Sorry, I've just got to myself the wrong part of the paper. So really, um, you know, I haven't, I've heard lots of really um, good challenges um, and good suggestions about, uh, about you know, where we need to be and um, challenges on elements of paper. But I think I'm hearing that most people are broadly in agreement. David, do you want to? Sorry, just a quick one. Just looking at the, recommend the recommendations, uh, there's talk about uh, um, uh, bringing it back for June. But, you know, come July, you know, we're going to, the CCG side of things is going to be a lot different and we might have more, to, you might, might be able to have better discussions about it once we know what the sort of governance structures and things are like for CCG after that. I don't know if that was, if if, the, if we bring it back in June, it might be a, sh a short discussion with lots of, oh, well, we don't know, for example. If well, certainly I endorse not bring a final set of um, revised terms and conditions in June, whether or not we would want to bring something interim or indeed, you say, um, uh, um, wait uh, further. I don't really have a particular view, Ter Terry. Um, so just to answer that question, David, I hope, and, 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 um, and, and this is a hope, but we should have it, um, I would hope that we would be able to describe the new governance structures of the ICB and therefore agree membership from their perspective in advance of the 1st of July. I think if we go past the 1st of July, we might have missed a very serious boat there. So I, I hope we will have that. But I just take George's point on board is the ICP <coughs> will have to do what it needs to do to operate and be safe on day one. But that doesn't mean that that will definitely be the way that it, it will permanently work. So I, I think George's suggestion of bringing an interim paper is probably uh, an interim terms of reference is a good one. And we put a review date on that for, say, six to 12 months after. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Dan? 
Yeah, I think just to, to say that the, the critical thing is that the board can't sort of sign off its own terms of reference and see that as a done deal because the board is formally part of the council constitution. So we can sort of make a recommendation, the board can make a re recommendation to full council to say this is what the terms of the reference board should be. Full council then has to formally agree to incorporate that into the council's constitution. So there is a sort of a process to go through which we need to have completed in order for future, particularly on the NHS side of things, for people to be able to take up their positions for the September public meeting. So we really need to have, if the ICB is to be operating from the 1st of July, we need to be in a position to do all that stuff in time for the September meeting. So hence, we need to have something pretty clear by June on membership, if nothing else. Yeah, thanks. I, I, think, um, I think I saw, saw the word final and overreacted in, uh, in the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Terry, um, and I'm not quite sure who I'm making this recommendation to, probably um, something maybe for Dan or, or Lucy to consider. Given that we've just spoken through those timescales, um, I think as a health and wellbeing board, we need to write to the designates and let them know that's the time frame that we're working to. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that as long as we can, maybe, I mean, I, I would personally probably, uh, probably out, out with this meeting probably could do with a bit more clarity around those timescales, given I know what it's like getting things through uh, full council at the moment, let alone under the new system, which, which is going to, you know, have its own um, teething issues, no doubt. So, yes, let's definitely pick up a conversation and make sure that the um, ICB data links are um, informed to that. Is, um, given those points and, uh, um, and also really noting, and I know they have been noted, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the really excellent contributions um, we've had on this, um, are people overall um, comfortable with the, um, you know, uh, the, the recommendations uh, today? I'm not seeing, I'm seeing lots of nods, so yeah, I'll take that um, as agreed, if that's okay. Thank you all. Okay, um, our sort of, um, uh, our, our penultimate uh, uh, substantive item today is uh, taking stock of the um, of, of our strategy. Um, Greg, are you going to introduce this one for us, or plan to? Thanks, George. Uh, this is uh, a relatively quick, and it is a verbal. Um, uh, this uh, I'll start with an apology. This is supposed to have been nearly done, but we've had some significant staff illness, um, that therefore it hasn't been done. So I'll give you a where we are. Um, um, we're always committed to a sort of a mid 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 um, mid session interval review of the health and well-being strategy, and it is about two and a half years, nearly three years old now. Um, uh, those of you that have read it, you've all read it. I'm sure you will carry it around with you in your bags. Um, it's basically a good strategy. Um, uh, it's broadly sound. The aim to remind you is to narrow the gap in healthy life expectancy, and there are nine broad ambitions. Um, its strength is it strategic? Its weakness is it strategic? Um, and as Ben just noted, the sort of what goes in is fabulously complex and really quite difficult to control. Um, there are some things that are in the strategy that are not explicitly name checked that do make a massive difference to the goal, the gap in healthy life expectancy, and most obviously, um, cigarettes. Um, we compete with the East Riding of Yorkshire for our tobacco prevalence, and that makes a difference. But it's not name-checked in the strategy. Does that matter? Don't know. Um, poverty, cost of living, is clearly a big thing at the moment. It's always been a big thing, but it's really a big thing at the moment. So there are some things that probably do need some more formal anchorage to the health and well-being strategy. The context has hugely shifted since we started this. Clearly, uh, the, the, the pandemic, the fog is now lifting slowly. Um, cost of living, levelling up. The huge government policy, love or loathe, but it, it is a government policy. There's a massive overlap between, uh, certainly in, in name, some bits of levelling up, but, but, but in spirit, uh, quite a lot of it, actually. Um, so what, what um, some of my team have committed to do is to, similar to Lucy's done with respect to the board, to interview um, a, a number of people, a relatively tight number of people who are very directly involved in the ambitions and then some wider bits, um, um, to, to, to get a sense of their, what they think is currently the main issues within each of those ambitions and some, some, wide, some wider things, not to rewrite the strategy, but to review and to refresh the, the strategy and to bring all of that back together, um, uh, timed to a point in the future, and we may come back to the point in the future in just a second. Um, so so um, we've never 
committed to producing an action plan for the strategy for, for the reason it's too broad, it's too sprawling, and I think it would be a plan that would be this thick and nobody would ever read it. Um, so, and I think that we'll stick with that. So the, the, the review is now started. Hopefully, um, uh, Lorraine and Chris have started doing some interviews. Um, the aim is to get a sort of a state of play. What's, in e what's the current state of play in each of those nine ambition areas? What's there in terms of delivery? There's plenty there already. What are the opportunities and what are the threats? And what are the things that may change the trajectory? There's an obvious opportunity to tie that to, and the strategy broadly to the levelling up ambitions and particularly the health challenge, I think it is, framed within the levelling up strategy. I think we should do that, to be honest. Um, uh, that would probably serve as, serve as well. Um, I, I wouldn't be under any illusions that the, uh, the, the, the gap is, 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 is the gap in healthy life expectancy is as easy to uh, close as we want. Mike Marmot was uh, put on the spot on this in a conference I was on last week. Um, his view is it's biologically possible to close the gap um, until relatively recently life expectancy was going up by about one year every four. So you can get your five years of added life expectancy over about 20, but it's now flatlining. So his view is if we want to kind of address that, we need to put right the issues of the last 10 or 12 years or so. That's a big deal. Um, uh, and it, it, so, so we will do our best within the strategy, but, but uh, let's not kid ourselves on the, the, uh, the, the, the ease of what we really, really want to do. Um, aim is to bring all of that together, um, times with the substantial shifts in the governance of various of our uh, sovereign organizations um, and to bring it all back, all back together and, and probably have a sort of a, a, a relaunch event um, summer, possibly before the summer holidays or possibly autumn to be, to be determined. But, but the, the timing is to bring it all back together um, time with the substantial shift in council governance and when some of the dust settles on that and the substantial shift in NHS governance. That's broadly the plan on timing, but it's not absolutely fixed. Um, I'll pause for breath. Thank you, Greg. I think that's a, a good overview, um, considering, uh, yeah, and you've explained well the kind of the work that is going to be undertaken um, to, you know, to get us to that slightly more um, broad view of where we have the strategy. Are there any particular questions for Greg on that one? Um, not seeing any. Oh, so sorry, Helen, was that a question? Yeah, it's just a comment. I, um, I totally agree that we need to be. We need to be looking at the context, and I think levelling up is a really key part of that. And I think it's it's the sort of, it's an example of where we connect health and wellbeing board into what's happening more broadly, and the whole set of things that play into people people's life expectancy and quality of life. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, anything else we gonna um, anyone want to say? No. Um, with that, thank Greg and close that. I Right, now, um, Judy, um, we're coming to you for a health water update. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, colleagues, this is uh, uh, an update we do about things that Health Watch is hearing, things that people are telling us and what we do every two or three months. Uh, so thank you for your time listening to it. You can see the full report on the Health Watch website. I'm going to pick out four things this time. Um, uh, the first one is about long COVID. Uh, we're doing some work with STH uh, to shape a plan to understand better people's experience of long COVID, uh, uh, but particularly those who haven't accessed support, didn't go to the hub, didn't get other support. Uh, and, uh, and it's really an issue, I guess, about health inequality. Uh, and we'll be coming back to here, I think, with a, when that, that piece of work has been completed. Uh, we suspect it's very underreported and we want to have a look at that. The second one is about there's something called the Accessible Information Standards. I've often said in these reports that communication between patients and uh, services is a critical factor, and it going wrong is often one of the things that people tell us most about. Um, so there is a review of, that, of those standards, and Healthwatch England, which is the national body for all local health watches, is doing a piece of work called Your Care, Your Way. And again, we'll be trying to look in Sheffield about the issues that come up from that review to see how things might be improved. Uh, you never get it right, you're always getting it right, and it's hard to do. Um, but I think it is really critical, and 
uh, you'll have seen times when that goes wrong. And that brings me thirdly to primary care. Um, the, the new plan around hubs, um, our experience so far, and it's relatively new, is that people are not aware and they're certainly not informed about the plans. So we've had the public, we've had some GPs, we've had some counsellors saying, well, what is this about? I just tell you something. Um, it seems to us that engagement with people, citizens, is rather coming late in the day and we're rather worried that it's perhaps too truncated to really impact on um, how those hubs are developing uh, and whether that engagement is joined up with a bigger plan. We did a bit of work in Firth Park, um, accosting people, asking them if they knew anything about it. Um, they mostly didn't, despite the Star article and so on and so forth. Um, but the question people asked in various ways was, what, well, will this improve access for me? That was a key question, and they were rather sceptical when we told them about it. We'll be doing more work on that, but I think it's a, it's a slow-burning issue. I think we need to be watching quite carefully on that. And then one last one, and it's the one I keep bringing up, which is about dentistry. Um, uh, and really, um, it's almost a question about oral health inequality. We were challenged in the, the council scrutiny committee about whether we were going on about this too much, really, and whether there were many people. So we, 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 we took that on board, and we got in touch with all the uh, dentists in the city that said they were open to NHS patients. Not a single one was. And what they said to us was, uh, well, you can go on a two-year waiting list, or you can go private. So you can see in all those things, that thread around equality, around access, and around the messages and the reality. Uh, and it seems to me that those are things that Health Watch will keep focusing on. But I'd alert you to those very briefly, because I think they're really, if we really are serious about health inequality, it's the devil in those details. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. That was a really um, good and challenging um, update on, on those four issues you outlined. I think, you know, uh, I really appreciate the clarity um, you brought to a, a lot of those issues. Um, do we have um, questions or comments about what Julie's just um, said? Um, Greg. No, sure. um, on the long COVID, um, I'm committing to doing a piece of work, but I'd love to do a piece of work on what the data tells us about who with the profile of who has access to service and what does that look like compared to either the profile of the city or the profile of those who we know have had COVID, though we don't know everyone who's had COVID that then develops long COVID, but there'll be sort of an equity analysis type of piece of work in there. It needs a bit of thought. Well, I'll spec it up a little bit, but I'll, I'll commit I'll commit Chris and my team to do that, to do that for us. Um, on the dentistry point, um, yeah, oh no, only too full well, um, having tried to get an NHS dentist for a broken filling, um, uh, I could wait two years or I could pay privately. Uh, I pay, pay privately. I can afford it. Lots can't. Thanks, Greg. Come in, Liam, please. Uh, yes, just um, while dentistry is in my mind, I, I haven't seen the latest figures, but certainly pre-COVID, the, the, the most frequent reason for a child to be admitted to the surgical unit at the children's hospital was dental extractions. It, you know, again, it's, it, it's, it's looking at the whole system, isn't it? It's, it's massively expensive <laughs> to secondary care in the children's hospital because there aren't enough dentists in the community. And, uh, you know, it's being able to challenge that and, and understand the consequences. Um, it's a huge problem. And with regards to the hub, I'll just um, declare an interest. I used to be a partner at Firth Park Surgery. And Firth Park holds my heart in terms of clinical care. Um, I think there are a lot of concerns um, about the, um, the representation that's going to be um, available in terms of uh, public consultation with regards to the hubs because it is very difficult um, to access um, a lot of the community or for, for the communities to access the information and in, a, in a way I have actually seen the questions and um, it, I'm not sure if you answer the questions that you would have be giving informed consent I think it, they're not as wide-ranging as I'd hope they would be 
but that's just my personal opinion. Um, but it's something we need to be aware of. It's a very diverse community and there need to be a lot of different ways of consulting in order to get um, information back. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Terry, do you want to come? <clears throat> so, Judy, I just wanted to come back on the, uh, the primary care hub point. Um, so I'm going to have to be careful how I answer this question because we're now in a pre-election period. Um, so I do, I do have to be careful with that. Um, what I would say, Judy, is um, I think our comms and engagement team um, have accepted that we could be doing this better and are trying to take some steps um, in terms of better engagement with those communities. Um, the, the CCG absolutely welcomes as much noise and as much attention um, uh, as this warrants. Um, the, the more voices we can hear from local communities, uh, the better, because that will enable us to make better decisions that better serve those communities. So um, I absolutely you know, welcome it. One of the options is for us to do nothing and to send the money back to government. And we are committed to doing that if that's what local communities tell us we need to do. So um, you know, please encourage people to come forward with their views. Um, there will be a, a series of uh, engagement events. Um, I haven't got the exact details of the dates of those at the moment, but we are working on them. Thanks, Terry. Do you want to come at that, Director Judy? Uh, just briefly, uh, and we are working with, with that team, and that's, that's very welcome. I just don't want us to get into a position where people are doing this, and I think you're absolutely right. The more voices we hear early, Consult early means what you do later is better. So um, really welcome that. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Judy. Um, David. Um, I was just thinking about the, the dentistry side of things. I feel like we don't have enough clout uh, in the CCG to sort of influence NHS dentistry, except that I was talking to Sandy uh, last week or something about how the, the difference in uh, sort of commissioning primary care service, including community dentistry, that's going to be coming, that's going to be sort of... Um, uh, coming towards the uh, ICS and hopefully, hopefully devolved to us. Um, so we might have more uh, teeth uh, to, to sort of deal with this, um, but not immediately. Um, so I look forward to, to, you know, getting stuck into that. Um, the other thing, uh, uh, you know, speaking, speaking as, a, as a GP working in Sheffield rather than necessarily on behalf of the CCG, this business about... Um, patients and their their attitudes towards and their worries about access and then for me also thinking about patients wanting care closer to home which is something that we really like but then it feels like for them that they're they're getting shifted away from their practice across the street to the local hub but um but one thing that i just wonder if these people are are assuming and it might not be a safe assumption is that the status quo is um is sustainable um but yeah thanks thank you david uh, greg please Thanks. Uh, sticking on the teeth theme, um, uh, so I think I'm right in saying this, that NHS dentistry, Sheffield is actually quite well served compared to lots of other places, so we might think it's hard done to, but, 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 but comparatively it's not, notwithstanding your, you can wait two years or you can see a private dentist immediately point. Um, um, the, 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 um, the, the deal breaker is with the, the Pandora's box of the privatisation of dentistry. Um, that, I don't think we can go back on that. Um, I genuinely don't think we can, and that has been the, the, the deal breaker. The problem isn't actually dentistry. Better oral health isn't going to come from better dentistry. Um, the, the problem will come from better oral health. We spend £30 million on NHS dentistry. We spend £130,000 on oral health improvement, um, uh, uh, and, and that's where the answer is going to come from. Um, and there are two big things that aren't within oral health improvement, narrowly defined one of them is sugar, one of them is fluoride, and there's plenty going on in, in both spaces. Uh, can brief, brief on both at a suitable point in time. Thanks, Greg. Any more questions or comments um, for Judy or, or on the report? Uh, Terry? So thank you. Um, just on that point, and, uh, and, and around the dentistry, so we're, we're specifically picking up on dentistry. I just want to pick up, Greg, on oral health, because it's not just about teeth. Um, and, and that's a really crucial bit here is... Um, you know, we, we can go back to NHS England as the Commissioner of, uh, of Dentistry and we can talk about teeth. Um, but we know people with really poor oral health are at much higher risk of heart disease, much higher risk of other inflammatory conditions. Um, and, and I just wonder then to what extent should broader partners who don't have responsibility for commissioning the fixing of teeth 
be involved in the oral health agenda. Um, so that, that's just a, it, it's a question to put out there. I don't have the answer for it, but I think we need to start thinking about that as we, we begin to work in new ways. Thanks, Terry. Could I come back to that, Greg? Uh, I agree, 100%. Uh, I, I, and I'm the Commissioner of Oral Health Improvement, uh, and the, the service that's delivered by the teaching hospitals is really, really, really good, actually. And they are interlinked and embedded with a whole range of other services. They think of oral health in the round, not just things that happen to teeth per se. There's always more that we can do. There's, we're always looking for new angles and always looking for new new partners. But 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 no, agree 100%. I just uh, make comments. Yeah, yeah, Judy, yeah, Judy, I, I mean, I think that's really welcome because when we first started talking about this, I think people acknowledged the response was, we don't commission that. Uh, and I think there's something about seeing health and well-being in that wider context, which isn't just about who commissions what. Uh, my worry about the ICB, etc., is that it, when commissioning gets even farther away, it's one of the things we've had a real challenge about is where on earth was it commissioned? Well, we did eventually find out, but trying to make a contact there was really difficult. And I think that does make me worry in the future about there's a citizen here in Sheffield and the decision making there a long way away. And narrowing that gap, I think, is a really strategic challenge for this board and dentistry is an example of that. Thanks, it's interesting. I'm risk of facilitating a conversation through a chair, but Greg, one more time. Uh, I, I think, given the conversation we've just had, I'd suggest a focused update to the board on oral health. Um, there's a whole lot more to the box than just dentistry, and so uh, I think a sort of a state of state of play: what's good, what's not, uh, where, where where we are, where we need to be. That's that, that that's a good idea. I'd suggest we try and pick that up in the next steering group, if that's okay with people. Um, and Sandy. Yeah, sorry, just to come back on Judy's point. Um, so Sheffield CCG won't be no more in uh, July, but uh, we will be the ICB. So even though the ICB may take that on, we will be able to, as Piers said earlier, challenge the ICB if they're looking at something at system level, but there will be devolved in place. So we will have that um, empowerment. We will be able to still uh, understand from a citizen level what is needed. So please don't worry about where it will be in the ICB because Sheffield CCG function will be the ICB. Thanks, Sandy. Any final points on this? I think thanks to things again. It's been a really interesting um, conversation about a number of topics. So I, I think this is a really valuable item. OK, thank you. Everybody. Close the item and thanks to the health watch as always. Now just turning to um, uh, the um, minutes of the previous meeting, which um, is all seems to be all the way back um, from um, October. Um, I'll just go through these um, page by page. A any um, matters of accuracy or anything that needs um, pointing out, please just um, signal. Thank you. Uh, page one, or well, page 55 doesn't seem to be for me, but there we go. Uh, <laughs> page two. Page three. Page four, page five, page six, page seven. Oh, and that's it. Um, David. You're too polite to say it, but you spelt Sandy wrong. It's uh, I E, not Y. So, yeah, apart from that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure we could have that amended for um, all future um, um, minutes. Thank you, David, for pointing that one out. Any other point, Terry? So um, it's not the agenda, it's an AOB. Oh, you're just far too early. Um, so we'll take those as agreed with that um, one amendment, if that's okay. Um, close that item. And then if we, uh, yeah, take Terry, please do come in. Um, so, as members of the board will be aware, we have responsibility um, and oversight of signing off the Better Care Fund um, as one of our statutory duties. Um, and I just thought it would be worth this board noting it's thanks to Jenny Milner, who's been doing that job for um, several years now, supporting the board in that. Jenny's last day um, in that role today, um, and she's moving off to another, another post um, within the NHS. So, I think the board would want to uh, formally note its thanks to Jenny. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I would um, heartily um, ag 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 agree with that. I think um, 
you know, many of us here, um, either in this board capacity or in a number of other capacities, um, have worked with Jenny a lot over, you know, the last few years. Um, and, um, you know, with, with regret that she's leaving, but I know she'll um, make a real difference uh, as she goes to NHS England um, and works on a lot of um, exciting and a really exciting agenda there. Um, and as someone said to me in recent days, um, I'm sure the story of Jenny in the um, Sheffield system is not quite done yet. I'm sure we will see more of her, and I'm sure she'll use her, her new role to, um, um, to support things we're doing here. I'm confident of that. So, um, yeah, are we all happy to know our, 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 our thanks to Jenny? That's brilliant, and thanks for raising that, Terry. Okay, um, that just leaves me to uh, say that um, we are... Again, we're meeting um, on the 30th of um, June. Um, it does say venue to be confirmed, whether or not, you know, early discussions today <laughs> about different venues <laughs> might come to fruition or whether we need to be back in this place. Nice as it is, um, will be confirmed. Okay, thank you all for your attendance today um, and for all those who are listening at home. I'll call the meeting closed. Thank you then. Bye bye.